Yeah, I think, I think the whole business of deep topography or post-psychogeography or whatever it's called, this solitary wandering or communal wandering at the edge of the city is, has become really a major practice because almost every day, you know, I'm receiving packages, films, DVDs, collections of photographs, drawings, scribbles, whatever, from people who are out there doing this thing in, in a kind of compulsive, addictive way, not really even because they expect to stage exhibitions or do anything with it, but they just, I don't know why, it's, a, it's like a strange millennial compulsion to, to, to be there and to, to make some kind of record or response of things that are on the edge of disappearing. And I think more and more and more this is becoming a major way of uh, coping with the monolithic energies that are now oppressing us. If you live somewhere like Hackney, where I live, it, it, it's become evident that for the first time, local government and central government are in complete agreement that, that you need only to concentrate on major projects. And this has shaken out all the eccentrics. People like Nick, if he was here, would be exposed. I mean, the mole man, this character who who excavated beneath a house for many years, undisturbed, creating a network of tunnels. Or the owl man who lives further down this street here, who has, has filled his house, a squatted house, with wild birds and birds of prey. And ignored for years, nobody cared. I mean, what did it matter? But now that the, 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 the borough is visible, and now that we really want to put up huge projects along Dalston Lane, tear down theatres, then these eccentrics become in endangered species. Walking, walking is really a strange, obs obsessive, or totally natural form. But it, 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 more than ever now, for some reason, as it's a, as it's a slightly threatened activity, it, it seems to become more important to to people in the city, because spaces where you might might once have walked, like canal banks, which they were forbidden for a long time and then you were allowed onto them but nobody really went onto them except for fishermen and dog walkers. Suddenly these canal banks are being used by cyclists, I mean real hard heavy duty cyclists in the yellow and the hats who are heading off down to Docklands because the, the British Water Board have, have decided that, that canal banks are a valuable resource and they're building up more and more blocks of property along it and, and therefore the walker is challenged, the walker is shoved off. And of course, as you create more and more of these monolithic structures I've been describing, ease of passage across the city is ever more denied, so that the walker becomes somebody uh, like a gorilla. He has to duck and dive even to negotiate a passage across the city. And, and so, obviously, a, a renegade figure like Nick would need, at the edge of the city, to walk. It would be the only way, if, and, and he'd have to keep walking to get to somewhere where he's allowed to walk and then walk becomes a form of practice, becomes a form of breathing and memory, touching the ground. It's the way that narrative presents itself. I don't think any other form engenders narrative in quite the same way. If you're in a car, you're in a pod, you're, you're in a kind of dream, you're sealed off, it's a reverie. If you're on a bicycle, you've got to be so conscious of your, the traffic surrounding you just to survive that there's no time to get into this kind of stream of natural consciousness, which is walking. And therefore, walking becomes the most natural form for lifting your consciousness. And I think all of the, the real spirits of the city are doing it all the time. Well, well the current city is, is clearly a city of major conflict. And it's, it, the conflict defines itself as an argument between the virtual and the real, I think, majorly. And it's, again, if you go out to the edges of these new great developments, they, they will be totally surrounded by initially a blue fence, which looks like a blue screen in television on which you could project any kind of reality you want. And what they do project is a computer-generated version of the truth. And what they repudiate and won't allow is any form of photography. So if I try and take a phot photograph of this fence, I'm arrested. And on the fence will be a magical future city, but it doesn't exist. It's a complete fantasy. Any of the new states where they're, they're putting up major projects, you will find a version of it on the fence before the thing happens. 
even if it's contradicted by the thing that's right behind it. So we have to invent ways to, to allow the grunge, the dirt, the dust to, to represent itself. And the interesting thing has been this plethora of mural painting, wall painting, anarchic, anarchic art, uh, uh, crocodile heads, monkeys, whatever. As much as the virtual goes on, the actual comes up to challenge it. And the city is this argument between these two forms now in a big time. And it's an argument between bits that are sealed off, that are totally enclosed, self-reflective, and bits that are loose and floating. And between the two things are endless collisions. And those collisions can uh, lead to arrests, harassment, perpetual argument with security guards, who are themselves the bottom of the food chain. So it's, a, it's an awkward, difficult, uh, ugly space to manoeuvre and manipulate. And I think to successfully do it means that you, you literally go into the street like a gorilla. You, you go in ready, ready for action. You're, you're, you're on foot, you've got the rucksack, probably got a camera, a notebook, and off you go and you, you're, you're up for anything that's going to be thrown at you. Otherwise, we're swept aside and you're, you're just in this viral torpedo of public transport, picking up on the germs that are knocking around, being over over challenged in every sense, economically or otherwise, to, to, to move. And the only way to, to keep freedom of movement is to walk. Well, suburbs of London have always been deeply exotic and unknown to me. I've associated them with stories I've heard from people like Chris Pettit, the film director who I've worked with, grew up in, in the northern suburbs where his father was, had military connections. So he, he grew up on what was the equivalent of some sort of military estate. And the edge of the city is always, although the, the suburbs may look rustic and endearing in some ways, I've always felt that they were a sort of military estate, that they were an encampment of some sort of people who were escaping or ready to control us in the center of the city. And then the, the strange thing that's happened now is that the suburbs are being imported. That Hackney, which itself was once an Arcadian suburb, being just beyond the city walls and very healthy and salubrious, after being held up as in a city disaster, has now imported estates that look as if they belong in St Albans or right on the edge. That the idea is to put tear down your tower blocks and put up this unit which will be to some extent again controlled by CCTV surveillance systems, uh, closed roads and all the rest of it and, and uniform in appearance, all this mustard coloured brick, slightly prison like architecture, space for cars and, and imported into the inner city so, so the difference between suburb and city diminishes all the time until you get into the real suburbs and, and you notice that the, the defining thing is there's nobody there. It's this kind of threatening silence as you walk through and the sense of eyes on you as you move and your, your permission to get through there is challenged. And that, even that is being imported into the city. That, that the states that I've been walking through now seem to have no kids. If you go through them in the day, there's, no, there's nobody really there. The only thing that's there are the cars that are parked waiting. And so I think every, everything is in the process of being turned in, inside out at the moment. And if Nick in the future wants to walk into the edge lands, he'll have to walk in as well as out. Because I think the inside is going to be equally as strange and alienated as those fringes have always been. And the only definition of the edge lands out there, as far as I was concerned, was this huge motorway that turned London into a literal traffic island. Ballard, of course, uh, you mentioned, uh, lived, living out in Shepparton for so many years, turned everything around by, by making the idea of boredom the most exciting topic of all. His idea was this sense of alienation at the edge was where the future would be auditioned and all of the curiosities that were going to hit us were going to come from there. And, and the fact that, that London was just a... A, an extension of Heathrow rather than the other way around, that the airport would would expand and that the film studios are out there and the retail parks and the marinas and all, all the things he loves until in his 
final novel, uh, really, the, the huge shopping mall on the edge of the city has, has become the new religion. And, and the only way out of it is, is his usual solution is there is some form of terror erupts to challenge the boredom. And th those are the endless arguments between boredom and terror. And the, the landscape for that is suburbia.